Hey guys, it's Haley and welcome to another bookish video. Today I'm going to be doing a highly requested video. This actually was suggested to me by my patrons. If you don't know, I have a Patreon. It's always linked down below. You're free to join. Well, it's not free to join. <laughs> but it's a free country and you can join if you want. And my top tier has a video suggestion box where they drop in video ideas for me to do. And this is one. So thank you so much to Megan for this suggestion. Love you, girl. Megan stays basically planning my content for me. <laughs> But in today's video, I'm going to be tier ranking some common trill thriller tropes, really? Some common thriller tropes. I read a ton of thrillers. About half of the books that I have read in this year, 2022, have been thrillers. So I'm very excited to rank all of these tropes for y'all. And I think I'm going to find out a little bit about myself as a thriller reader along the way. You know, what things do I like? What things do I not like? What are the common threads that will lead me to enjoying a book versus not enjoying it? Let's go ahead and get started. All right, screen recording has begun. Hopefully it's working or I'm literally gonna cry. This is the tier list that I have made. I will link it down below if you want to do your own rankings with this exact list. But I have 30 tropes down here or like different elements that are common in thrillers that I'm going to be ranking. I'll just go through the tiers real quick. The top tier is auto buy, okay? If a thriller has this in it, I'm gonna buy the book and I can't hold myself back because it feels like something that I am guaranteed to love. The second tier down is it pulls me in. Okay, this is a trope that if I see it or I hear it in a synopsis or I hear someone talk about it in a vlog, it's gonna pull me in, it's gonna intrigue me. The middle tier is it depends on the use. Sometimes this works out for me and sometimes it doesn't. The tier below that is pushes me away. So the opposite of pulls me in. It kind of makes me hesitant. Maybe if I hear this is in it, I will remove it from my TBR or move it down my TBR. And then the bottom tier is literally die. Um, if I read a book with this trope or thing in it, I want to die. I want the author to die. I literally want to kill them. <laughs> Me just making threats in the first two minutes of the video. That's what we love to see. Now, um, it's the bottom tier for a reason. It's because these tropes suck. So let's go ahead and get started. The first one that I see here is it was all a dream. The worst twist known to man. In my opinion, if a thriller ends with it was all a dream, I feel like my time is wasted. Literally die. That is the worst way that you can end a book, I think. Next up, we have something pretty basic, something that I feel like is to be expected at this point in many, many thrillers, and that is multiple POV. I'm going to put it in depends on the use. I think sometimes authors use this completely to their advantage and we see a different side of the story or of the mystery with each perspective that we have. But some authors can go just a little crazy with multiple POV. We have unneeded POVs. It's also really annoying when you have that one POV that you don't like and you're just dreading reading from that perspective because it's so boring, it's so annoying, it's so whatever. That's kind of how I feel. It depends. The next trope we have is, is it a ghost? These are going to be thrillers where it's kind of laid out to ask the question, is this a ghost? Is this something paranormal or not? I'm thinking of Insomnia by Sarah Pinborough. I'm thinking of Hidden Pictures by Jason Recolac. I'm thinking of Home Before Dark by Riley Sager. And when I name all of those books, for me, I think it is pulling me in because I've read and enjoyed all of those books which is so funny. I knew I was going to learn something about myself because I don't typically pick up books that have paranormal elements. That's just not something that draws me in. But if it's like a question of is it a ghost or not, apparently that's something that does pull me in. The next trope we have here is blackmail. Uh, I don't typically love a blackmail in my thrillers. I think it's kind of a boring story to follow. So I'm going to put it in pushes me away. 
I am not the biggest fan of blackmail in my thrillers. Um, if it's an element, one of many, okay. But if it's the main plot of the story, uh, don't love it. Next up, we have a missing kid. Oh, you know where this is going. I love a missing child. Did somebody steal the baby? Did a toddler wander off? I love that shit. <laughs> I just think a missing child, like a kidnapping story, raises the stakes instantly. Like, I don't care if a suburban mom is literally being blackmailed about her affair. That just does not interest me. But all of a sudden, the kid is snatched. Oh my god. It's high stakes. Alert the presses. Call the police. Like, let's fucking go. That is pretty much uh, an automatic buy if I hear that a thriller has a missing teen, a missing girl, a missing baby, a missing kid i'm sold i'm thinking little secrets by jennifer hillier i'm thinking the housewarming by sc lines i love that shit next up we have a stalker trope and i'm gonna put this one in depends on the use I love books with stalkers such as You by Caroline Kepnes, but I also think the stalker perspective is really hard to get right. If we're following the point of view of someone who is a creepy stalker like Joe Goldberg, it really has to be a defined character that gets us on that guy's side. And for me, I'm not going to be on a crusty stalking man's side like 90% of the time. Joe Goldberg is just a standout for me, but a lot of the other books that have like you vibes or described that way, I don't like because the execution just doesn't hit like it does with Caroline Kepnes's books. Uh, so it just kind of depends for me. A mental health twist. Oh, ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. Y'all know where this is going. Literally die. Um, mental health is not a twist. It should never be a twist. A psychological disorder should never be an explanation of anything that's going on. No, 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 no. That's going to be a straight up no. Podcast elements. Honestly, I know this is surprising, but it pushes me away. It really does. I think it is so overdone. When I hear a thriller has a podcast element, I know a lot of people would normally get excited about it. For me, it just feels tired at this point. It feels like the author is really trying to bank on the whole podcast craze of the past two years. And I just don't love that. It feels a little disingenuous. And a lot of the times the podcast chapters are really boring to me. Or it just sounds like a script, like back and forth dialogue that feels really like stilted and not genuine there's no like flow to it a lot of the time so i know that's kind of controversial but that's my opinion next up we have a creepy kid that's gotta be an auto buy i love a creepy kid i love when a kid is so cute and adorable and is just like in the corner drawing and then you look over their shoulder and it's a demon i love when a kid is so cute and has a little bow in her hair and then runs up to you and is like you're gonna die in two days like that shit is hilarious to me. I love a creepy child. The Perfect Child by Lucinda Berry. Again, hidden pictures, shit like that. I love it. Family drama definitely pulls me in. I love a family drama. I love a fucked up family dynamic. Maybe it's because I'm a therapist and I just love seeing all of those different attachment uh, issues laid out, but I am so interested by family drama. I always want the tea. Every single Lisa Jewell book ever, this is why I love it, because of the family drama. Wow, I love that every tear is even. That is like very pleasing to me right now. Amnesia? Eh. For me, it depends on the use. The forgetful or memory loss of the narrator trope in a thriller I've seen done really, really well, but also it can go really, really wrong if our main character is just losing time for the sake of the plot and it feels like there's no reason or justifiable explanation, that's where I start to get annoyed. Ugh, the not who we thought we were twist. Okay, this definitely depends on the use as well. 
This I feel like is the most common trope in thrillers that have come out in the past two years where you get to the halfway point or the 75% mark and all of a sudden someone that we thought was one person for the entirety of the novel we find out is actually someone else. And it's getting a little tired for me and I've seen it done wrong so many times that it just depends on the use because there are other times I would say the first few times I read this or the best written books with this in it, it does it really, really, really well. Obviously, I'm not going to give away what books do this, but some of my very favorite books of all time have this twist in it. It's not that I hate it or that it pushes me away from reading the book. It's just that it has to be done right. Toxic friendships. Uh, uh. I would say I would say pushes me away. Honestly, I used to pick up books for the toxic friendship content, but I feel like again, this is just something that is so popular, like the single white female kind of thing where a friendship turns toxic. It's usually focused on female friendships um, and a dynamic between two women that turns sour. And yes, I think that is intriguing to read about, but a lot of the times I feel like there are some problematic elements to it. I like when the story is framed by you know, commentary on female friendships and feminism, but I think it's really easy to go into the like crazy bitch trope territory, which I hate. So eh, maybe I should put it in depends on the use because I have really liked books with this in it. Uh, but if I hear about it, it makes me want to move it down my TBR. So I'm going to just keep it and pushes me away. Cults definitely pushes me away. I have enjoyed some cult books, but if I hear that a book has a cult in it, immediately I'm going to think I'm not going to like this one. I don't want to pick it up anymore. I don't know why. It's just not content that interests me. I don't love it. Unreliable narrators though definitely pull me in. I love an unreliable narrator. I love to parse things out myself. I love a bitch that we can't trust. Those are the most interesting reads to me when I don't even know if I can trust the person who's telling me the story. Haunted House, literally die. I don't think I've read a haunted house book that hasn't had me bored for at least 50% of it. The only haunted house book that I've enjoyed is Home Before Dark by Riley Sager because I am obsessed with Riley Sager. I will literally lick his bald ass head. I am obsessed with him. <laughs> Everything he writes is great, but every other haunted house book to me is not up to snuff. Like it's just not, there's not enough interesting content in there. Even haunted house movies, I don't love as much. Like Paranormal Activity, I don't know why y'all were passing out in the theater because to me nothing happened for an hour and a half straight. Like why am I going to read 200 pages of nothingness just for 50 pages at the end of like a chair moving across the room. Uh, no. Police POV definitely pushes me away. I do not like reading from an investigator perspective. They always seem just a little too removed from the situation and you always have to deal with like protocol and meeting at the station and doing interviews and I just don't like reading like police procedural stuff. Uh, I would rather read from someone who is in the action. A speculative twist. You know that's an auto buy for me. I love, love thrillers with speculative twists. If I hear that there's just a little speculative element, a little magical realism, a little time travel, a little ghosty ghost, a little demon just in the side or <laughs> towards the end of a thriller that kind of is a part of the explanation for the drama, I'm so in. I love that shit. Isolated setting that's an auto buy as well. I love a cabin that's all alone in the middle of the woods. I love a snowy isolation. Uh, all of these isolated settings, chef's kiss. It just creates that atmosphere that's already creepy. I'm already going in scared. Okay, we're not just walking down the street and going to Whole Foods like we are in the middle of nowhere. Return to a hometown. Okay, this depends on the use for me. I do like a small town thriller, but when a main character is returning to their hometown, 
it can feel really repetitive. Like I've heard this story before. Sometimes I like it. Some of my favorite thrillers have this kind of element in it, like Jar of Hearts by Jennifer Hillier. I absolutely love that book, but I've read a lot of just like average to bad thrillers that feel like airport books where it's like the hallmark structure of this is a person who's from this town and something happened after they moved away where they have to go home and investigate it. It's either good or it's bad and it just depends. Revenge, I love. That definitely pulls me in. I love a good revenge story. Immediately, I feel like that just increases my empathy for the main character. It gets me on their side. I want to take revenge with them. Love revenge. Dual timeline depends on the use for me. I love, love, love a dual timeline of like what happened in the past and unraveling the secrets versus present day. Where I think dual timeline can go wrong though, and it depends on the use is if the one timeline is boring. And I've read that a lot, especially with like timelines that are really, really historical. Like girl, I do not care what was going on in 1901. I don't. And this is kind of my struggle with getting into like Jennifer McMahon books, which I know she writes more horror than thrillers. Um, I also had this issue watching the Fear Street movies and thinking about getting into the Fear Street books as well. I don't want to read about shit in the 1600s. I just don't care. I hate that shit. And if they start talking like doth, blah, 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 blah I literally kill me kill me I hate that shit like that would go in the literally die category so fast but then I've also read dual timelines though are my favorite books of all time so it really just depends alcoholic main character <laughs> I feel like this is one that everyone would say pushes me away because it's so cliche not me it pulls me in I love following a bitch who starts her murder investigation at 10 a.m with a fat glass of chardonnay I just think it's hilarious, okay? I love that trope, like the fat glass of wine for a suburban mom who's like investigating her neighbor. <laughs> I love that. And it also contributes to another one of the tropes that pulls me in, which is an unreliable narrator. And it can also contribute to like memory loss amnesia, which I like sometimes as well. Uh, so I like that trope. I think it became so popular for a reason. It's a good way for it to create intrigue and unreliable uh, narrator vibes. It can explain time jumps, time losses, and it's in a way that I think is understandable. Like if you're in a traumatic situation, you're definitely gonna be more likely to imbibe. So I don't think it's just like a throw way explanation I actually don't mind that element at all morally gray characters y'all know y'all know where this is going auto buy I support women's rights and women's wrongs I love a morally gray woman specifically and I also love a moral dilemma in my thrillers if there is some kind of moral dilemma ever at all I'm gonna be intrigued and I'm gonna pick up the book immediately like that book something in the water that was one that nobody talked about but I saw it everywhere and I just had to buy it compulsively because I knew there was like a moral gray dilemma situation in there and I had to know what it was about and I did end up loving it Ooh, oh my gosh this is one of my favorite tropes ever it's definitely an auto buy kind of similar to morally gray this is how far would you go for your family so if somebody's kid fucks up and they have to do something illegal to protect them if somebody's husband does something and they have to go around and try to do something if there's a murder that's being covered up a cheating scandal that's being covered up anything where someone in the family has to risk their livelihood for somebody else. I think those stories are intriguing as fuck. A whodunit? I think it depends on the use. Uh, I think whodunit stories can be done really, really well and just have like fun, cozy vibes. But I also think they can be really, really boring. See Nine Lives by Peter Swanson. Good for her. 
auto buy. I love that trope. That is my favorite trope possibly ever. I love a good for her book. I actually have a whole recommendation video of 12 good for her thrillers that I highly recommend. I will link it above and below if you missed it. Small town thrillers. Okay, so we kind of already talked about this. I think it depends on the use. I do like a small town because it feels like that more isolated setting. There are secrets, but it's like open secrets. Like everybody kind of knows everybody's business. I love that kind of a setting. And I also love like a suburban small town. I think I, I like suburbia small town thrillers a lot more than like country bumpkin small town thrillers. That's where it can get annoying and boring to me. A cheating spouse literally die. I'm sorry. I'm done hearing about cheating husbands. I literally don't care. <laughs> Girl, I don't care that your husband cheated on you. I don't care that you're cheating on your husband. It's just not intriguing and not as something that I would want to pick up anymore. Uh, it's giving Kirsten Modlin and I'm not into her anymore. And the final trope that we have here is rich people drama. I think you know where this is going. Pulls me right on in. I am a sucker for a good bougie rich person drama thriller. Good Rich People by Eliza Jane Brasher. I love that shit. Anything by Geneva Rose. Oh my gosh, The Last Mrs. Parish by Liv Constantine. All of that stuff. Those are all five star books for me. I'm obsessed, obsessed, obsessed with rich people drama. Even if the thriller plot is not good, I just love reading about the opulence. I'm such a sucker for that. So she pulls me right in. So that is my final tier list of 30 thriller tropes. I hope you guys enjoyed this vlogmas video and tomorrow I'm going to be giving you my ranking of 30 horror tropes and these are going to be horror tropes in books and movies so I'm very excited to do that as well. I'm literally about to film it after this. <laughs> Thank you so so much for watching. Don't forget to give me a like if you liked it and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Don't forget to go to therapy and read a book this week and I will see you in my next video. Bye! Oh,